My friends, I'm speaking in Lincoln, Nebraska on August the 10th. I would love to see you there. Log on for details for that and all my speaking events coming up later on this year at sethandrews.net slash events. Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The Thinking Atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Hey, my friends. Thank you so much for being here. Today's just kind of a fun show. After 450-some broadcast, I'm always mixing things up, trying to uh, you know keep it entertaining for you and occasionally distract myself. We talk about some heavy stuff. We've got some very heavy topics in the last several weeks and coming up in the weeks ahead, and this is just a fun one. It's actually a reminder of when I used to do FM radio. I was on uh, KISS FM in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we had done a whole morning show on just the some of the stuff that people had done when they got drunk. You know, this is a show with thinking in the title, right? And yet when you're wasted, these things go out the window and you end up in some pretty precarious and often entertaining, sometimes dangerous situations. Now, I can't speak to this personally, and I'll throw this out at the top of the show. I'm 51, never been drunk in my life. I don't like the taste of alcohol beyond the occasional sweet wine. I'm like Penn Jillette. I've never in my life been drunk, no desire to get drunk. I'm terrified what might happen if I was to be drunk, you know. Oh, you know, Seth woke up naked at the zoo kind of thing. <laughs> so, so anyway, the uh, call-in number you can use if you have a story about, uh, and make it a good one. You know, if the, yeah, I went home and I, I couldn't remember where I was. Yeah, I, no, save that. I don't need that. I'm looking for a, a great story of something that happened that you're like, I can't believe I survived this. I can't believe I did this or someone else did this. I really would rather not need any drinking and driving stories because I don't think that's funny. I don't want to talk about endangering the lives of other people. But beyond that, if something, you know, some wild stuff happened, when you were unthinking, that's what today's show is going to be. And if it's not your cup of tea, no sweat, no problem. I'll see you back here next week. I just thought it would be kind of fun. Now, I have to say this, and I'm glad to say it. This is not in any way an attempt to try to make light of people who have struggled with alcohol addiction or know someone who is an alcoholic. All right. I know it's it's a touchy thing. Uh, this broadcast is not about that. This is about somebody who just overdid it once or twice, 10 times, something like that. And they have a story that they tell at parties, okay? Uh, in no way am I trying to minimize or marginalize those who have been through uh, the process of addiction recovery. I was in Denver at the Colorado Secular Conference, and there was a table there with an addiction recovery organization called Life Ring. Now, I'm interested in secular sobriety options because... Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has this higher power model that just drives me crazy. Now, I'm not saying it hasn't worked for some people, but they're doing all the work. It's still human beings. Life Ring doesn't use any of that higher power stuff. Now, I didn't get a chance to go through much of their material, but I was interested because I'm always interested in secular solutions to something that religions have largely dominated. And uh, so if you want to do your own homework on this, if you know somebody who's trying to get over an addiction of any kind, their website is lifering.org, and you can check out their materials and find out more. And I may actually talk to somebody from the organization here in the next uh, month or two because I'm curious myself. Lifering.org, okay? But with that caveat, we're just sitting back talking like we talk among friends over the table on the couch, swapping stories, chuckling at what are usually thinking friends and family members and associates are capable of when inhibition is removed by alcohol. Uh, oh, look, there's somebody on the switchboard. Let's talk to them. 850, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? 
Hey, this is Stephanie from Pensacola. What do you have for the broadcast? Well, there is a local business opening up soon here. And at first, I saw that it was a an axe-throwing place, you know, like a sport activity, stress relief, you know, like throwing darts or like a shooting range, like similar to that, I assumed. Yeah, let's describe that um, for the listeners who may not know what that is. Forgive the <laughs> interruption, but it's like they take these um, uh, pores or vertical tree stumps. They cut these sort of tree sections out that are round or pieces of wood with a target, and they mount them on a wall, and you take a hatchet, and you actually throw them like old school medieval battle style toward and and try to stick it into the the wooden target. So they opened one of those up near you in Pensacola. Okay. It's not open yet. I just saw, um, I think they had a preview. So they put out an official like article in our local paper, but I had just driven by before that. And I was like, Oh, that looks interesting. That looks like an interesting thing to try, like similar to maybe going and trying archery or something. And I told my mom about it and she was like, Oh, well, huh, that makes me think of dart throwing. Um, is that like at a bar or something? And of course, my first reaction was, no, of course not. They wouldn't serve alcohol at this place. That's ridiculous. And then yesterday, I saw the news article, and it's like, yep, it's a bar. And I'm like, what? <laughs> They're going to serve alcohol at a place where people are throwing hatchets around. Yes. And of course, my first reaction is, oh, geez, we have a large, young, single community of um, young, young men. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm thinking of the stereotypical big, drunk guy, you know, I'm probably being too stereotypical, but I'm just worried about it. No, I think that's a legitimate concern. Plus, let's see, what's the gun law situation in Florida? Do you guys have conceal and carry? Can people have firearms down there? Yes. Um, yeah, my, my significant other actually has a concealed carry, and he's very responsible and knows all about it, And but he would never... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it will go somewhere with alcohol. (laughs) They just uh, they just had a a shooting recently here in the parking lot of a fitness center. Somebody carried their gun or they had them in their vehicle and these guys got into an argument and just shot each other. So when you have alcohol, hatchets and firearms all in the same direct vicinity, there is, I think, legitimate cause for concern. So, yeah, keep an eye on that place yeah. when you drive. We'll look for the red and blue flashing yeah, lights. Definitely like gonna... Didn't know. Yeah, definitely going to. Stephanie, you're awesome. Thanks for calling. Appreciate you very much. Thank you very much, Seth. I'll see you later. Oh, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and the casting down of the imaginations. That's what they used to tell us in the church, you know. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Of course, the guy pulls out an axe. I'm thinking, you know, my money's probably on him. (laughs) I mean, I don't know. Just a few from the Facebook page. Amanda says, I tried to take out my contact lenses even though I wasn't wearing any. God, that's horrifying. She says, turns out there's a very thin layer of membrane around your eye that you can pinch with your fingers and pull on. It made a snapping noise when I lost my grip on it and it moved back into place. My eye was bloodshot for weeks. That is horrifying. Horrifying. Gerald said about 30 years ago he was intoxicated, stole a statue of the Virgin Mary in front of the city hall in his town during the Christmas holiday, dragged the statue 12 blocks back to his house. He said she still makes an excellent conversation piece in his living room. Gerald, is that real? Come on. You just yanking our chain. Or do you really have a Virgin Mary statue in your living room? I want photographs. All right. Mark said he threw a homemade Molotov cocktail off a friend's balcony in an apartment complex. He caught somebody's Jeep on fire. Christine did something she calls urban surfing. She essentially climbed out onto the roof of a moving car and she rode all the way to her destination by holding onto the lip of the windshield with her fingertips. By the way, she was wearing a mini dress and platform shoes. Christine, that's a movie. You know what I'm saying? That's a movie. Scott said he was drunk. He climbed a windmill with some friends when he was in West Africa. Candy said she had 18 shots in a row of Everclear, 151, and Sky Vodka. What's 151? Sorry, I'm not a drinker. I woke up to my friends pulling me out of a refrigerator. (laughs) Oh, my God. 
Party at Jeffrey Dahmer's house. Yeah, with candy. Uh, Thanks for sharing that one. Amy said when she was in her 20s, she got a little tipsy and was dared to swallow the worm. After that, she sang karaoke into a fork. Kirk got wasted on his 25th birthday, picked a fight with a guy in a Chuck E. Cheese costume. The children who were watching may never recover. And Stephen said that he got drunk as hell when he wrote his final exam for his final college English class. He had to pass this particular test and the class to be able to graduate two weeks later. And even though he was absolutely plastered, he still got a C on the test. Stephen, we salute you. I uh, remember a story. There was a couple. They both went out, and uh, they were probably in their young, low 20s. And they both went out to a party, and they both got pretty lit. And uh, she was telling the story on the radio, which is why I remember it, because I was hosting the show. And she said, and we came back, and we were both in a pretty bad way. And we curled up in the bed, and we were spooning. So he was the big spoon, right? He was behind her with his arms around her, and she was tucked inside him, and they were both facing the same direction. So he was the big spoon, and she was the little spoon. And they were lying there in the bed. And he was so wasted that right there in the bed, he threw up all in her hair just vomited up all over the back of her head right there in the bed. And that's, uh, I'm sure that's something that has tested their relationship. (laughs) I'm sure they they were tested that day. The bounds and limits of love are tested when somebody else upchucks in your hair. I'm just saying. 413. Thanks for waiting on me. You're on the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Colin. Colin, what's going on? I think one of the ones that I'm most proud of that didn't result in any pain or suffering uh, on any part but my own was uh, a particular time back in high school where I, uh, it, I don't know if you know the, uh, the connection between the number 420 and marijuana, but that was a, it's a thing, apparently. I don't really understand it myself anymore. But uh, what it was is uh, I was hanging out at a friend's house and uh, we couldn't seem to find any pot to smoke. But we did have a gallon of gin, and uh, I imbibed most of that gallon of gin, and then was very, very content in trying to walk to the store to buy a candy bar. Uh, I proceeded to fall down about 800 times on my way to the store, and especially falling down in front of the police station, so they had to come out and ask me if I was okay. All the while, I don't know how on earth they didn't realize that I was so smashed I could barely see, and I made it to the store and bought a candy bar and came back. All the way to buy the candy <laughs> bar. All right, my friend. Thanks for uh, calling the show. I appreciate hey, it. thank you. This is actually an interesting segue into a question I don't know the answer to. Let me go back to my display monitor. This is published in Time Magazine. Here's the real reason we associate 420 with weed. I don't know the answer to this. Let me just start reading. We'll see. I'm going to read this cold, so bear with me. Uh, Normally, I try to prep this stuff in advance. This is by Olivia Waxman. Last year, Time Magazine, both marijuana smokers and non-smokers recognize April 20th or 420 as a national holiday for cannabis culture, but few actually know how the date got chosen. Some say 420 is code among police officers for marijuana smoking in progress. Some note 420 is also Adolf Hitler's birthday. And some go as far as to cite Bob Dylan's song, Rainy Day Women, number 12 and 35, because 12 multiplied by 35 equals 420. But to put it bluntly, those rumors of the history behind how April 20th and 420 got associated with marijuana are false. The most credible story traces 420 to Marin County, California. In 1971, five students at San Rafael High School would meet at 420 p.m., by the campus's statue of chemist Louis Pasteur. They chose that specific time because extracurricular activities had usually ended by then. This group, Steve Capper, Dave Reddix, Jeffrey Noel, Larry Schwartz, and Mark Gravich, became known as the Waldos because they met at a wall. 
They would say 420 to each other as code for marijuana. As Reddix told Time in 2017, we got tired of the Friday night football scene with all the jocks. We were the guys sitting under the stand smoking a doobie, wondering what we were doing there. The shenanigans continued long after 4.20 p.m. too. The group challenged each other to find ever more interesting things to do under the influence calling their adventures safaris. Later, Reddick's brother helped him get work with Grateful Dead bassist Phil Lesh as a roadie, so the band is said to have helped popularize the term 420. On December 28, 1990, a group of deadheads in Oakland handed out flyers that invited people to smoke 420 on April 20th at 4.20 p.m. One ended up with Steve Bloom, a former reporter for High Times Magazine, an authority on cannabis culture. The magazine printed the flyer in 1991 and continued to reference the number. Soon it became known worldwide as code for marijuana. In 1998, the outlet acknowledged that the Waldos were the inventors of 420. Our education continues, my friends. I've uh, never smoked weed myself. Don't have a problem with it. I think it's stupid that it's not legalized. I think it's ridiculous that people are in jail for it. It's funny, when we were in Amsterdam, beautiful, beautiful place, the entire city smelled like weed. The entire city smells like weed. I'm just saying. Uh, Let's see. 912, you're on the switchboard here. You are now on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? Hey, Seth, this is uh, Jay. I'm down in southeast Georgia. What's going on? Lots of callers from the south today. That's cool. What's on your mind? I've got a story about the first time that uh, I ever got drunk. Uh, I was about six years old, and uh, this is uh, it's more of a lighthearted story about how everybody involved was stupid, and it's a wonder we all got out of life. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's why they call it youth. And well, no kidding. Well, this include this this particular story includes my father and one of his friends. So uh, all right. it's an all around hold my beer moment. All right. But uh, my older brother and I and one of our cousins, we were all going to go fishing out at a friend of my dad's way out in the in the sticks. And uh, we got out there. Dad and his friend adjourned into the house to do some uh, preliminary drinking, I guess. And, uh, the, uh, the kids, we all went into, uh, uh, <laughs> dad's friend had a, had a, a game room in an outbuilding and we all adjourned to the game room in the outbuilding cause it had a pool table and it had a uh, stand up video game machine. This was in the, this was in the eighties, you know? So, uh, he had a, a Nintendo and just a bunch of things that would attract kids. He also had a full bar and uh, a refrigerator that was full of beer. Refrigerator also had Coca-Cola's in it. Now, we knew that we were not to touch any of the booze in the game room. We knew this, and we didn't, or so we thought. But on, sitting on the bar was this jar, and in this jar was a whole bunch of cherries that somebody had picked. They were real cherries, not the red crappy maraschino type you know well nobody said we couldn't eat the cherries so we ate some cherries little did we know that the cherries were soaking in 151 proof rum (laughs) (laughs) we didn't get but a few of them down because they didn't taste very good (laughs) wow and uh uh we didn't get too many down but as it turned out, it was 151 proof rum, so it doesn't take much when you're that young. And uh, Ed and his friend came out of the house, and they were ready to go fishing, I guess. And uh, they called us all out to the yard, and we all came out, and uh, kind of wobbly. And uh, Dad goes, boys, are y'all ready to go fishing? And my older brother pipes up and says, Dad... I don't give a damn if we go fishing or not. <laughs> dad takes the dad kind of does a double take and looks back at looks back at his oldest boy and says, "I'm sorry, what did you say?" I, I said, "I don't really give a damn." <laughs> 
at this point, that was time, he cluing in as that, to your uh, sort of inebriated oh, state? Yeah, he, he was cluing in that something was wrong because he kind of narrowed his focus, narrowed his eyes and said, y'all boys been doing any drinking in there? We told y'all to leave that stuff alone in there. Y'all been doing anything? And I, at this point, I piped up and said, no, we ain't been drinking. We just ate some cherries. And the jig is up. Now, my dad is quite the raconteur, and whenever he tells this story, that as soon as he slurs my words out, then he pauses and he says, it was at this point I knew we were fucked. <laughs> 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 he said, because I had three drunk youngins on my hands, and I knew that my wife would kill me when we got home. So the plan was to take us fishing, and uh, on the pond, kind of, it was at the back end of this fellow's property, he had a little John boat out there. Dad figured that the only way that he was going to get out of this, and he's also fond of mentioning that he and his friend were about half lit at this point, so it sounded like a grand idea. He figured the only way that he was going to get out of this is if that we were just so slap tired on the way home that we just... We all passed out, and uh, and that he had a good excuse for us all having been passed out in the in the back of the truck on the way home. So they decided that uh, it would be a good idea to put us all in the boat, take the plug out of the boat. What? <laughs> and push and push us out into the pond. Oh, okay. Whoa, whoa. Hang on, just a second. All right, I'm still stuck on you take two drunk children to a body of water. I'm still stuck on that part of the story. <laughs> right? I mean, well, like 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 I said, it, it was it was the it was the it was the middle 1980s and the adults were inebriated, so Okay, all right. So uh, they they put but, you guys in this little boat <laughs> and they they pulled the plug out of the bottom of the boat and set you adrift. Set us adrift. Yeah. With what and, end goal? Uh, we didn't notice. Uh, we had a paddle. We were all wearing life jackets, so we weren't necessarily going to drown. Um, but the idea was that as the boat filled up, that we would wear ourselves out trying to get back to the, uh, <laughs> trying to get back to shore. Oh my God! Call social service. Which is absolutely call the authorities. Which is absolutely how this you Georgia party Absolutely how this went down. <laughs> God, somebody call somebody. I am horrified. All right, so you're out there in the water, and the, bo- the boat starts to fill up. You have an oar in your life jacket, and you what? You're just flailing about trying to get back to terra firma? Just trying to get back, trying to get back, trying to bail out water, trying to get back. Yeah. Now, we do finally make it to shore. I believe we had to jump out and, and, and swim about the last little bit because the boat had taken up enough taken on enough water that it was kind of dragging the bottom at about the last say i don't know 50 feet ashore thereabouts luckily it was uh not a very deep pond it was a calculated that <laughs> dad like to say that it was a calculated risk on his part <laughs> You know, there's only a one in four chance our children are going to violently drown. I, I, you know, let's roll the dice on this one. Just push them out. Let them swim. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he sounds like a father of the year, definitely. All right, so you get back to well, shore. My, you're exhausted. Hey, you're all. You are probably exhausted, and we all just kind of. It, it works out. I, I'll give him this. It worked out according to plan because we were all exhausted when we got back to shore and we all pretty much passed out on the way home. Mom never and, knew. Uh, Mom never figured it out. Not until years later when he, when not until years <laughs> later when he told the story as, as, as it actually happened. Oh God. I, don't know. <laughs> I thought she was going to kill him then. This was maybe 10 years after the fact. Oh, I would have loved but, to uh, have been a fly on the wall and seen the look on her face when she found out. It was kind of a family get together, and it was a story time. So it was a group of people. He, this was, a, I think, another calculation on his part. He figured he could get away with telling the story without getting hurt too bad. Your father's life seems but, to be uh, a series of cost benefit discussions. Truth be told, it kind of was for a while. Now, in his defense, he did quit drinking about twenty years ago, twenty two, twenty three years ago. 
And uh, let's say some of his decision making process has sort of improved. I think after that, but, probably uh, so. Yeah, probably it, so. Well, that's it, you know he but he he he's been sober ever since, and we all survived. So, well, that's a you know, <laughs> hey, that's a good. At least the story has a happy ending. Everybody lived to tell the tale. Thanks for sharing that with the listeners. I can see the chat room, and they're having a good time with that. So, thanks for the call <laughs> and for sharing the story. Be good down there yeah, in Georgia, yes, okay? Yes, sir. I'm a big fan. It's good talking to you. Yeah, it's an honor to talk to you. Thanks a bunch. We'll catch you later. All right. Um, I watched um, The Princess Bride, one of my favorite films, Rob Reiner film, and I rented the audiobook on Audible uh, about the making of The Princess Bride. It was written by Kerry Elwes, and it was also narrated by him. And he was talking about all the different elements of making in the film and what it was like. And, you know, that's I'm interested in that kind of stuff. I love movies and behind the scenes stuff. And he was talking about Andre the Giant, the big uh, wrestler. I mean, the guy was massive, this mountain of a man who played uh, Fezzik in the film, The Gentle Giant. And in real life, they say he is, or was, rather, I know he died a long time ago, but was one of the great drinkers of all time. This massive guy who would just down, literally down bottles of wine in a single sitting. And it came to light later that because of all the injuries he'd sustained as a wrestler, that it's possible he was drinking that much to mask pain. So I'm not trying to make fun of his pain, but they were talking about the fact that the guy was just, he would just soak his massive mountainous body with alcohol. And then wherever he happened to collapse is where he would spend the next eight to 12 hours. Often in like the lobby of the hotel, he would, you know, they'd be on site and he'd be here, he'd be there, he'd come out of the room and he would just lay down on the floor wherever he was. They were in a hotel lobby at this one instance and he was just wasted. He'd had so much alcohol and he just went and he just fell down and they had to just cover him with blankets right there in the hotel lobby and everybody had to walk around him for the rest of the day and the night as he slept off this massive alcoholic intake. And, uh, I mean, that's amazing. He didn't care. He, he just lit himself up and then collapsed. And wherever that happened to be, if it was in the street, if it was in a, a, a restaurant, he would just, and that's it. Somebody cover him up. Try not to trip on him. We'll see him in 12 hours. Three, one, four. You're on the thinking atheist podcast. Who's this? Good morning, Seth. This is Phil. I didn't throw up in my wife's hair. But I have one that has stood the test of time in our relationship over the years. Okay. About uh, 20 years ago, I turned 27. We went out to celebrate at a Mexican restaurant. I had uh, ordered a grande margarita. It was very good. It helped. Uh, went down smoothly and uh, had a few more. I don't particularly remember ordering the fourth or fifth. I don't remember being walked to the car. I don't remember being sat down in the car, driven home, and put in bed. But apparently, as I was in an alcoholic blackout, I remember a dream that I had to pee really bad. And I'm searching for a bathroom and uh, finally found one that was free, sat down, and started going. The next thing I remember is being woken up, hearing my name being called out by my wife. So apparently, I had been put into bed completely naked, lying face up, facing the ceiling, and uh, it just did its little thing and went over on that side of the bed. So, wait a minute. Oh. Hold on. You peed on your wife? I peed on my wife. It was an unintentional water sport. <laughs> okay, all right, hang on. Hold on. So... She, okay, no, ask, ask all you want. She's asleep next to you, and all Correct. of a sudden, all of a sudden, she feels this. I don't want to be too graphic, but she feels the warm no, sensation. You can be graphic. I don't want to. I don't even want to think about it. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, what is her disposition at this time? What, what was her attitude? What did she do or say? Um, she had not had anything to drink, so she 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 was operating at at full capacity the instant. She woke up. <laughs> I hear my, her scream my name. I wake up, 
and the light goes on and she is well and the blanket is it's just you get the picture uh, i get the picture yeah um yeah it was just it was just you know go hey you know go throw all this in the washing machine right now i'm gonna go take a shower kind of a thing but it was uh it was never really discussed afterwards it wasn't a taboo subject she didn't uh, it didn't seem to bother her and we laugh about it now and it has never happened since it's one of the things that uh you know the, the many things that are in our relationship that have stood the test of time and she's been great all the years we've been married and it's probably the only it's not the it's not the only time i've had a blackout uh, alcoholic blackout but it is the only time in which i peed on my she, wife she stuck with you after all of that i mean that's she sure did wow. all right well thanks for thanks for giving us a window into your into your life on this occasion Very and usual sure. situation absolutely all right my friend you enjoy the rest of your week Seth. thanks phil Take we'll see care. you later all right bye what would your reaction be? I, I I think, what the hell? How could you? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think of what what I would be like. What's the matter with you? I'd be pissed if, if you'll pardon the expression. After a short break, I'm going to come back with some actual news stories about people from around the world who, well, they overdid it and they paid the price and their loss is our gain. It's something that entertains us. We're going to be entertained. I'll do that. Plus more of your phone calls as we continue just a lighthearted show about the times we were unthinking. You can't believe you did it when you were drunk. More after this. Hang on. I think time is the most sought-after resource in the world. I mean, how often do we say to each other, you know, I wish I had the time, like the time to read a book or listen to an audio book. But with Blinkist, you have the time. Blinkist is the only app that takes the best key takeaways and the need-to-know information from thousands of nonfiction books and condenses them down to the book's essence. Perfect for busy people like you and me. You can enjoy an entire book in just one sitting. You can do it on your lunch break, on your commute to work, in the 15 minutes before bedtime. Eight million people are using Blinkist right now. And the library is just fantastic. They have books on health, history, science, business, so much more. I just finished the book Games People Play, The Psychology of Human Relationships, written by Dr. Eric Byrne, gets into mind games that people play on each other. Why do we do this? How is it rooted in our psychology? How do we get past the negative impact that these psychological games have on our friendships, our likes, our loves? Really good stuff. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for my audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Seth to start your free Seth. Day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B L I N K I S T. Blinkist.com slash Seth to start your free seven day trial. Blinkist.com slash Seth. Here's a story as reported in the uh, New Zealand Herald. This happened in the town of, oh God, I'm going to screw this up. Rotura. Rotura? Rotura. It sounds Romulan to me, so I'm just going to go with Rotura, okay? In New Zealand's North Island, a guy who was out drinking, but he'd run out of money and he wanted more booze. What is a drunk man to do? Well... This guy decided to sell his car for cash to the first person who would agree. And in short order, found somebody who gave him a few hundred bucks for his car so that the guy could keep on drinking. He woke up the next morning forgetting that he'd sold his own car and he called the cops to report it stolen. The moral of this story, of course, being don't drink and sell your car. Here's a story as reported in 2015. This out of Boston, Massachusetts. Apparently, environmental police saw a guy with a huge boat full of fish. No less than 122 black sea bass. Apparently, a drunk guy decided to take his fishing boat out for a spin 
and he went out on a fishing spree and caught 122 fish. This is well over the legal limit on many levels. I think <laughs> you can only catch eight fish in this particular canal because there are fears of overfishing. So let's do the math. That's over 15 times the limit. Actually, it's kind of a disgusting story when you think about it. What a tremendous and terrible waste. Casper, Wyoming, last year. There was a guy who was drunk out of his mind, wasted, claiming to have time-traveled back from the year 2048, and he had a warning. When the cops picked him up, Bryant Johnson said, I'm here to warn all of you about the impending alien invasion. He then begged to speak with the, quote, president of Casper, Wyoming, so he could help get the word out. By the way, this Bryant Johnson guy actually said that it was the overwhelming amount of alcohol in his body that allowed him to time travel. So that's an experiment maybe you can conduct in your own life. Just get yourself nice and sauced and then just see, you know, if you can go forward or backward in time. I mean, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's not possible. Here's a guy who, to his credit, knew better than to drink and to drive. Good for him. He decided after he was a little bit too, well, you know, that he wasn't going to get behind the wheel of a car. He refused a cab. He decided to walk home. He was at a pub in Lincoln, lives in Grimsby. Grimsby is 45 miles away from the pub. So he turned himself in the direction of home and he started his shamble dragging his body forward, finally deciding he couldn't go any further. He just stopped and went to sleep in the front yard of someone's home. When the homeowner found him, he didn't call the cops. He went out, brought him some tea, and he pointed him in the direction of the nearest bus stop, sending him on his merry way. Not only did the guy eventually get home via the bus ride, but the guy's mother went on Facebook and just said, hey, whoever you are, thank you for helping my son get home. Here's a story out of the New York Post. The incident took place in 2012. What happens when you're in a court of law and your court reporter is schnockered? So as the court reporter is banging words into the stenography machine. These are critical texts. This is a documentation of what is happening inside the courtroom to be referred to by the judge and attorneys, the public at large. This is what happened during the trial. This court stenographer was apparently having a day and the records for that particular court case simply said over and over and over and over, I hate my job. I'm guessing the next words typed in were mistrial, mistrial, mistrial. Let's do one more real fast. Cole Olson, 30 years old, pled guilty to one count of drunk driving at Hornsby Local Court, Sydney, Australia, following an incident at a drive through at a McDonald's. Now, Olson apparently went through the drive through after a night of heavy drinking, and he promptly ordered 200 chicken McNuggets. The staff said, I'm sorry, we can't get you 200 chicken nuggets. And he responded by screaming into the drive through speaker, I want my fucking nuggets. He then did four laps through the drive through lane while honking his horn, came back through and ordered 200 hash Browns. The workers actually obliged that request. I guess they went into the back and just opened up a big box, a freezer box, full of hash browns. They charged him hundreds of dollars for this before the cops arrived. Now, the icing on the Chicken McNugget story cake is that Cole Olson, inebriated 30-year-old in Sydney, Australia, is a vegan Now, somebody out there is probably talking about how there's not any real chicken and chicken McNuggets anyway. I know there was a bogus story that had been floating around a few years ago about how it was all made from this pink goop in a factory somewhere. And everybody lost their minds. Oh, my God. McDonald's chicken McNuggets are made from pink gelatin. Uh, No, they're actually chicken. I mean, it's not health food, trust me. But it's their chicken McNuggets. So.
I was uh, interested in how the brain is affected by alcohol. We talk about people who get drunk. Motor skills start to fade and your speech starts to slur. You know, you have some cognitive issues, shall we say, sometimes to the point where you do black out. Well, what causes that? What is the effect of alcohol on the brain? If we're going to do kind of a fun show about unthinking people, the people who, who had sort of muted their own ability to make decisions, let's uh, do a little science and let's try to figure out what the effects are. Specifically, I pulled up this article. Short-term effects of alcohol on the brain. If you'll humor me, I'm just going to read it. This was uh, posted at health.com. Drinking alcohol alters the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain, says Maria Pagano, Ph.D., addiction researcher and associate professor of psychiatry at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. These chemical messengers transmit signals throughout the body and play a large role in controlling behavior, emotion, and physical activity. For starters, alcohol slows down the neurotransmitter GABA, G-A-B-A. I'll call it GABA because it's fun to say. And that's what drives the sluggish movement, slurred speech, and slower reaction time in someone who's intoxicated, Pagano says. At the same time, she adds, alcohol speeds up a neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is responsible for regulating dopamine in the brain's reward center. It's generating feelings of pleasure and well-being, says Pagano. That's why you might get that warm, fuzzy feeling when you're drinking. Alcohol lowers inhibitions and clouds judgment as well, which could lead a person to engage in risky behaviors like having unprotected sex or driving a car while drunk. And if a person has an underlying mental health disorder like depression or bipolar disorder, it can exacerbate symptoms and increase mood swings. Binge drinking also affects the cerebellum, which helps regulate balance and the cerebral cortex, which is responsible for taking in and processing new information. When these regions of the brain are slowed down, a person might feel dizzy and stagger when walking, have blurred or doubled vision, and have difficulty paying attention to things going on around them. Your sensory uptake has been dulled, so you're not going to be taking in new information as well, says Pagano. The brain's hippocampus region, which helps create new memories, is also affected by alcohol, which contributes to blackouts and short-term memory lapses while drinking. Studies suggest that men and women experience alcohol-induced blackouts at equal rates, even though women tend to drink less often and less heavily than men. In the most extreme cases, drinking too much too fast can cause a loss of consciousness. We worry about that for safety reasons, of course, but this is also a sign of cell death, says Laura Ray, Ph.D., professor of psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles Brain Research Institute. So we also worry about brain damage. And with multiple episodes of heavy drinking, that damage can have long term consequences for learning and memory. Most of these effects are caused by a spike in blood alcohol content over a short period of time, says Ray. Taking breaks between drinks and being sure not to imbibe on an empty stomach can help reduce your risk of experiencing them yourself. Area Code 604, thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? It's Neil, the 604 Atheist. Hey, Neil. I was just morning, uh, honored to be able to uh, guest on your show a while back. Had a lot of fun. Thanks for calling, bro. What's going on? Well, I heard you mention, I have two little quick stories. I heard you mention the, uh, the Princess Bride movie, and it reminded me of a friend of mine who was trying to impress his girlfriend and wanted, because he wanted to, I think, propose to her that night. And uh, he wanted to take her out to a movie, and he suggested some, you know, typical guy film action movie sort of thing. And she said, no, no, I really want to see The Princess Bride. And he kind of rolled his eyes a little bit and, and said, okay, we'll go see this movie. Well, after the movie ended, it turned out that he loved it, and she hated it. I have no idea why she hated it, because I think it's hysterical. But It's brilliant. But, uh, yeah, that's It's a national treasure. Yeah, it is. You know? Wow. Exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah, so I just found that kind of funny. And then uh, my other story is uh, talking about this drinking stuff. Uh, we were in Jerusalem. We were 
having a great time, just wandering around the old city. And it, it was it was a, during a holiday called Purim. And uh, uh, there's a lot of drinking going on during Purim because uh, I think the object of the drinking is so you get drunk enough that you don't recognize people and everyone has a good time or something silly <laughs> like that. But anyway, it's, uh, we're wandering through the city and we notice there's a party going on in this room. And this old Hasidic Jew comes running out and he grabs us all by the arm and he pulls us into this party and he puts bottles of wine in our hands at the ripe old age of, I think we were about 16, I think at the time. And uh, we consumed tons of wine and apparently got really, really drunk. And the next thing all three of us knew, we woke up on the side of the highway outside of the city. And these guys, I guess, had dropped us off there afterwards because we got pretty drunk. I don't even remember. And uh, we were all provided with a couple of bottles of water each and uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, the little, one of them fruits that has a little nuggets in them, uh, pomegranate. Uh, so yeah, I guess we all woke up on the side of the highway with cars rushing by. Wow. And, uh, mm-hmm. and none of us can remember like anything past a certain point where we were forced into the, the dancing circle and whatnot. Woke so, up on the side so of the sure road. Were, yep. Yep. And well, they what, set us up, which was kind of cool. I mean, people are gawking at you like they're seeing these bodies laying <laughs> down. I mean, were you getting some attention? No, like nobody stopped. It was fairly early to, uh, probably around six thirty seven in the morning when we finally woke up. So there wasn't heavy traffic yet, but, uh, yeah, yeah nobody, uh, you could see people when we woke up looking at us, like what the hell are you guys doing on the side of the highway? But that was about it. Well, it was Jerusalem. They up Maybe they water. thought you were some of the saints yeah. who were going to be resurrected. You know, after the next coming of Christ <laughs> happens, lovely. you'll walk the streets. Yeah. Uh, well, sure. I mean, we sure looked half dead when we woke up. Uh, that's for sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Neil, you're awesome. Thanks for calling, my friend. You bet. Thanks. Have a great day, man. See you later. I was just curious about some of the terms for being inebriated or drunk. I won't read them all because there's a ton of them. But it's just funny. When we use descriptives to talk, you tell a story about somebody who got totally shit-faced or they were lit, or they were wasted, or hammered. Uh, Some other ones. You are swizzy. You are plowed. You are bombed. Liquored. Gazeboed. Smashed. Sleeping with peat. Loose as a goose. Tanked. Boiled as an owl. Boiled as an owl? Wankered. Steaming. Dixie fried. Blind. Wobbly, grand marshaled. I'd like some backstory on that one. <laughs> What's that mean? You are leathered. You are Hemingway, tanked up, shit housed, slid, moldy, loop, tuned, schnockered, drunkle, saucy, pie eyed, doing a Reagan, clattered, or tore up. Just some helpful language if you are trying to describe the inebriated state of someone you know. A couple more. 4-4 four, four on Skype here on the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Who's this? Hi, Seth. It's Susie. Susie, thanks for calling. What's on your mind? What do you got for us today? Well, I'm from England, so um, there doesn't seem to be quite the same issues with alcohol in the church in England. Uh, certainly, I've been brought up in a church where pretty much every event includes alcohol. There was one group in the church that I used to attend called, well, I'm not quite sure what they were called, but they nicknamed themselves Dad Behaving Badly. Um, And they used to go out drinking quite a lot to the local pub. And one of the instances, uh, they decided to sit on a wall outside. Uh, One of the guys was really drunk. He fell backwards off the wall and at the same time grabbed the person either side of them and just fell backwards uh, pulling them with him. <laughs> Hang on, and Susie. I missed the first the part of the story. Uh, you, you cut out just a little bit. Where did they go? What oh, was the sorry, wall? Sorry. They went to the local pub and they sat on the on the wall outside the pub. The middle guy fell backwards and pulled the other two with him. <laughs> wow. And it, the the whole of their um, kind of events and parties kind of ended in uh, disaster, really. Was it the uh, Winchester? So, and that's kind of because that's where we go in moments sorry, of crisis. Disaster. You always go to the Winchester. <laughs> I'll meet you at the Winchester. <laughs> so, how do you say drunk in um, uh, in Britain? Is it do you say you're pissed or uh, yeah, plastered, shit face? <laughs> do you say things like we're going to go have a pint, or is that just something they tell the tourists? Uh, yeah, pints, or um, we also call it a brew. Yeah, and there was. 
I've not been drunk very often, but the last time I got really, really drunk, I was out at a Christmas party and somebody in our group who I didn't even know decided to buy the licorice Sambuca shots, which tastes absolutely foul. You just knock them back. And I have no idea how many I drank, uh, but I somehow managed to get in the taxi, get home, unlock the door, uh, and I thought I'd go and have a shower to try and sober up so that the room wasn't spinning. And the next thing, I woke up in the bottom of the shower surrounded by brown puke. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, and every time I get drunk, I always say never again. Never again. Um, and maybe about five years later, I get drunk again. <laughs> I've heard uh, I've heard that about childbirth. Like, you know, as soon as you deliver the child after all of that agony, you're like, never again, never again. And then later on, you're but like, you know, I love babies. I will never do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad you're okay. You know, a slip in the shower, man, you could have messed yourself up pretty yeah. good. Yeah, so, I, I don't even remember. <laughs> she was feeling no pain. Thanks for sharing, my friend. Thanks for calling in from, uh, Thanks, uh, from across the pond. And I'll meet you at you. the Winchester, okay? <laughs> see you later see you later bye. all right bye by the way if you know what that reference is we can be friends just saying uh one more just for grins 210 you're on the thinking atheist podcast thanks for waiting who's this hi seth this is deb uh i met you a couple weeks ago at the atheist experience i'm the one with the bright pink hair Oh, uh, we had a great time. I was down there co-hosting the uh, broadcast with Matt Dillahunty, and we just had a ball. So, yeah, Deb, what's going on? It was a blast. Uh, Yeah, my uh, drinking story, well, personally, I've only been drunk once, hated the experience. My then-boyfriend, I later married him, uh, intentionally got me drunk. I got him back because I wouldn't go to bed until I sobered up. And, of course, the next day, he had a hangover like you wouldn't believe me i felt great <laughs> well I, I mean not to, i, I don't want to get personal here but hang on now he wasn't trying to get you drunk to like take advantage of you was he uh he wanted me to just be drunk he was actually it turned out he was an alcoholic uh he also tried to get me to smoke cigarettes and he just wanted me to do these things with him and i'm like no i don't smoke i don't drink but hey All right. you know. well, i'm just concerned for your safety i just like i just make sure you're safe <laughs> that you're okay no yeah, yeah i'm safe yeah. All right. i'm Good. safe he ex he's ex-husband and we're not going to get into that story. i'm not gonna but i'm not gonna cry we were- <laughs> i just want to make sure you're okay because normally when they're like yeah he was yeah. trying to get me you know schnockered uh then i always think oh shit you know what what is the evan mind so uh, but you've taken a yeah. hard line yeah. you decided you know never again huh you got it but my uh funny alcohol story has to do with his mother his parents were missionary baptists And when my husband and I were first married, he was in the army and he got sent to Germany. Not us, he. So he, his mom, his dad and me, we went to Germany to visit him. Now, I have been out of country. I've been to Germany already. She had never been out of the United States. She was, um, they were all from Indiana, smack in the Bible belt there. And being missionary Baptist her whole life, she never had taken a drink. Well, we're going to the chocolate shops. She loved chocolate. And I bought a box of liqueur-filled chocolates, and the liqueur is pear. And, you know, they're not cheap, so it's good liqueur, good chocolate. And she bought a box, too, and I'm thinking, okay, you know there's liquor in there. She says, oh, yeah, all right. Well, in the room that night, she ate the pear-filled chocolates, the whole box of pear fi- of the liqueur-filled chocolates. Uh, I guess she got rather cuddly. We <laughs> we heard about this the following morning from from his dad. Huh. She she got very cuddly with these uh, liqueur because yeah, if if you're a serious drinker, you're not going to get much of a buzz. But if you've never had a drink. There was enough in there that you're going to feel like, you know? Okay, she got, she, wait, and, she got uh, cuddly with the chocolates? She ate the chocolates and got rather cuddly with her husband, which was also, I guess, not a thing missionary Baptists do. Uh, <laughs> so, 
so he was upset because she got rather cuddly. Code for I think uh, it's uh, she got sweet and romantic on him. Oh, oh she was feeling a little frisky. Way. Yeah, him. you got it. All right, well, and he thought that was. Oh, he was so mad at us, and I'm like, "What did I do? I told her they were filled with liquor." <laughs> Different people react in different ways. You know, it's funny. Some people get they get frisky and some people get sleepy and some people get mad and tired. I, a friend of mine, it was like, you know, he, he won't drink tequila because he's like tequila just turns me into an asshole. And he's just the most beautiful guy. But apparently that has this effect on him where it brings out his darker shade. Everybody sort of reacts differently. So it's interesting to see what the reaction was on her end. Yeah, she was instructed to never buy li- liquor-filled chocolates again because she was a bit of a chocoholic. So, you know, obviously the whole box just kind of called her name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what, Mom? <laughs> Don't let anybody instruct you. If you have a craving for the chocolate liquor, I say go in there, pick it up, enjoy life. And, you know, if you're feeling frisky, just go in there and turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is... We were sworn to secrecy. We were not to tell anybody in the family or in that little town they lived in because everybody belonged to the same church. Oh. We were not to tell any about anybody about this incident. And so now and here like, you are right. on a global broadcast telling the story. Um, yeah. You've been a bad, bad... I think it's safe. She, Yeah, I think it's safe. She's been dead for over 30 years, and like I said, he was my ex-husband. I have no contact with the family or that town. So. The statute of limitations has definitely run out on this particular edict. So. Yeah. Well, you're so, awesome. I appreciate you but, sharing the story with us, and uh, thanks for calling the show. No problem. Talk to you later. We'll see you later. A fun show, an interesting show, a nice distraction... And uh, I appreciate you so much being here. It's nice to be able just to hang out, swap stories, be together. And we will get together and do it again next week on the Thinking Atheist podcast. And I will see you then. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.